Hi everyone, I'm, I'm sorry I'm a couple minutes late. I appreciate you taking your time on another second Sunday to uh, catch up with us. And um, I hope you're doing well. I'll just go right into it here. Uh, just remember the usual disclaimer that um, I'm not here to give individual advice, but I uh, hope this is useful in working with your medical team and your family to make best decisions. <clears throat> Usual stuff, <clears throat> the numbers just uh, are big and, and they kind of blur, but it's good to stay on track of what's going on in the world. And you know, it's just amazing how India just has accumulated so many total cases over time. Um, but relatively speaking, you know, the US continues to lead in terms of active infections and still more than you know, a little more than doubles um, India in terms of the deaths. So as much as it feels like we're out of the woods, you know, we, we still have uh, gone through a heck of a lot and you know, there's cases going around still, so don't forget about that. But the rest of the world continues to accumulate a lot of activity as well. This is what the map looked like last month at our last town hall. And you can get a sense of all the different hotspots. Hotspots are where new infections are occurring. And one gets, gets an immediate sense of relief a bit. It's, it's less hot, right? This is previously last month. And then especially in North America, it's cooled off. But, but obviously what's striking is just the tremendous burden of active infections in South America. In, in fact, uh, Peru, I believe, and Chile maybe, but um, at least one of the two South American countries has the highest per capita death rate in the world due to COVID. And, you know, as much as all of Africa looks relatively cool, there are definite known hotspots in the Southern tip. And it's highly suspected that there's a decent number of um, infections going on throughout the continent. It's just not that well captured given the, the systems to do so. And then you have the Middle East, India is still fairly active. Now, what, what's kind of uh, amazing is that we have so much capacity here. And as you've been hearing, the vaccine uptake has slowed down a lot and, and we have the ability to send vaccines to different countries and people have been coming to the US in, in somewhat of a medical tourism where they uh, are actually for the wealthier people in countries that have less access been scheduling trips to eventually make it to the US and get vaccinated. So people from Brazil, they, they you know, with all, the, all the, the cases going on there, they have trouble getting the vaccine. They have to go to um, a third country uh, quarantine for a couple of weeks. Hey, Terry. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, sorry, y'all. I think you have the right screen now, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, um, you know, tourists are willing to like from Brazil go quarantine in another country for a couple of weeks, then be allowed to enter the U.S. with a negative test to get the vaccine and then go back. It, it's just uh, crazy times. Here, this is the U.S. Uh, a month ago. I think it, get a sense of the different hotspots, and this is what it's like recently. So again, uh, much less activity throughout the country, some hot spots here and there for sure. But a, a simpler way of looking at it is this is a month ago, and then this is you know, recent. So just uh, less than a handful of states that are you know, standing out in terms of active cases. So here's the US, um, if you want to just simply look at percent change, you can do so here, but the graphs are at the top. The total number of cases have gone down by a third. Um, 
from the past two weeks, the hospitalizations have been going down by 23% and the deaths by 20%. And similar trends have been happening in the state of Georgia. This is a month ago. And then this is today. You know, still a lot of areas that are popping up through, especially in the rural parts, but getting better. And as you can see, oh, my mouse, okay. Again, the figures are at the top, but the cases have been going down by 23% in the state. The, the number of tests have been great. Um, they've held steady even this, despite the cases going down, which means the surveillance is that much more effective. The hospitalizations have come down a lot. At Grady, we only had like 15, even less than that uh, number of cases a few days ago in the hospital, in the entire hospital. And uh, deaths are going down slowly but surely. So news since last town hall, I mean, you've been all hearing it, the, the, the lowest number of, of cases or new cases in the US overall since uh, April of 2020. The number of vaccine doses administered worldwide, I mean, it's a huge number, but there's so many more people that need to be vaccinated throughout the world, uh, while the US and some of the richer countries have gotten um, a lot of their, their citizens vaccinated. Um, the UK on June 1st had no deaths reported in the entire country, the first time since the very, very start of the pandemic. Um, and you may have heard that some of these funky names that we've had to kind of show on the slides, the scientific names for the variants that have come out of different regions and, pre and previous, previously we've been calling them sort of the South African variant, the UK variant. We are switching to this Greek alphabet system where they're just gonna go down the Greek alphabet and go out alpha, beta, gamma and so forth. So if you haven't heard about that, that's why the names have been changing. Um, so we haven't had any formal questions submitted, but I, I've heard that, and it's not surprising, there still seems to be a little question as to who, um, who can do what. And, you know, I want to talk about uh, first the general population in terms of being fully vaccinated. And just a reminder that being fully vaccinated means that if it's a two dose vaccine that you've gotten um, the second dose and you're at least two weeks after the second dose. And if it's just a one shot Johnson and Johnson vaccine, it's two weeks after that. So if you've been fully vaccinated, I mean, it's a really simple concept actually. It's, uh, and this is straight off the CDC website. You can resume activities that you did prior to the pandemic. Um, so you can resume activities without wearing a mask or staying six feet apart, except where required by um, federal, state, local um, agencies, as well as local businesses and workplaces. And, and that's the other part of the confusion too, is that, and, and companies have every right to do this. Uh, you know, some, some are going fully open according to the CDC guidance here other um, national chains and stores and private businesses even are, are, are um, maintaining the, the, the masks in terms of the requirements to go in and do business. So um, just know that they're, we're in a big transition phase and I'll talk about this in a minute. There's a lot of different perspectives and levels of comfort and you know, what the CDC does here is, um, you know, I remind people that the title is what you can start to do. It, does, it doesn't say what you must do or what you're required to do. So um, it, what this is saying is that the scientific knowledge is, is such that in the general population, the vaccines have, uh, are known to be so effective that um, you essentially 
don't have to um, have any masking requirement or social distancing requirement in, in general public arena. Now there's some exceptions here, traveling, there's still gonna be the, the um, um, requirements for masking and the, there may be some quarantine requirements based on where you go. Uh, you, you certainly obviously need to follow rules when you go to a different country. Um, but know that for the general population, if you've been around someone who has COVID-19, previously we didn't really know that, you know, what happens to those who are vaccinated? Can they carry the virus and give it to somebody else? And the great news is that these vaccines are so effective that if you get a good response to the vaccine, and that's a big if um, to some people, and I'll get to that in a minute, but again, in the general population, it, it's, it's so good to these vaccines that there's a very extremely small chance of giving it to somebody else if you've been vaccinated. So even if you've been around somebody who was known to have COVID-19, you no, no longer need to get tested or quarantine yourself. You, you can, uh, unless you have symptoms and you know, God forbid, I mean, there are reports of people who do get COVID again after they get vaccine. But the other benefit of the vaccine is that not only does it protect you, but if, it, if you were to get symptoms and an infection despite the vaccine, if your immune response isn't as great, there, there's enough of a response that it blunts the original infection. In other words, the COVID infection is not nearly as severe as it would have been if you were not vaccinated. So essentially, I'm not going to say 100%, but if you look at the numbers that are being reported, there's an extremely small chance that if you get vaccinated and you get infected on top of that, that you're going to be hospitalized, um, let alone uh, go into the ICU or pass away from COVID. But, you know, this, this whole question of masks and the protection that it has in somebody who is immunocompromised that has lupus that has there are medications that may interfere with the vaccine response uh, i know these are very pertinent questions and uh, you know, there's even a question that we'll touch on later about whether the vaccines, how effective they are, period, in, in terms of people with lupus. So, you know, much of this is still being worked out and I don't have any, you know, strong recommendations or information for you today, but I hope to kind of go over perhaps how I think about all of this and maybe this will help you. Again, realize that even within our lupus community, there's not gonna be a right or wrong answer eventually just because uh, you have lupus as to whether you mask or you vaccinate. Because as we all know, um, we, we have a lot of commonality in our community in terms of what we generally deal with when we have lupus or we take care of somebody with lupus. I mean, that's what binds us together. That's what brings us together, um, our, our shared walk in that regard. But as you also know, there's a lot of variability in terms of the, the types of issues that we have specifically, skin, joint, kidney, uh, brain, uh, heart. I mean, the list goes on and on, right? And the severity how, how severe it is, how long we've had it, and to what degree it affects not only your body, but your mind. And so similarly, yeah, you know, I think these, there's a lot of nuances and variations as to uh, what type of lupus you have, what treatments you're on that may sort of increase or decrease the risk. So at the end of the day, it's really up to each one of us to, to work with our specific healthcare team and sort of balance this together, kind of compare and make the right 
decision for you. And again, I wish I could give you a nice little formula, you know, this plus this equals this, <laughs> or some sort of easy calculator, you kind of plug in your thing and it tells you to do this or don't do that. But it's, it's not going to be that way. And there's gonna be a lot of um, things to think about. What will get better over time is that the information to plug in will be more clear. And I, I still don't think that eventually we'll get to the day that you have one right or wrong answer, but, but the, the information you're feeding into your mind to ultimately come to this conclusion one way or the other will be more sound and they'll have more information and studies and data behind it. Um, so, you know, one thing to think about is, um, I'll talk about masking in general without thinking about the vaccine part. Um, let's say you're not vaccinated or you're someone with lupus that has been vaccinated, but you worry, or maybe in reality, your vaccine response isn't as strong. So you're not as protected. So in either case, you're at risk for getting COVID and having some potential complications of COVID. So either um, from the masking part or the vaccine part. And you know what we all worry about is not necessarily getting COVID itself, but the really severe complications of COVID. You know, COVID is one of many different viruses in the family of coronaviruses. It's a, and, and within this big family of coronaviruses are many of the viruses that contribute to what we think of as a common cold. And you know, we've all gotten colds here and there. So we, we've all had coronaviruses. We don't think twice about that that, but uh, what stands out for COVID uh, in particular is that in some people, um, you're gonna get this really severe response. And so what happens in the really re severe response that gets people into the ICUs on a ventilator and um, you know, unfortunately some of them even pass away. Uh, from left to right is time. So in the beginning, you have a lot of viruses, it's what we call the viral load. And you know, over time that gets lower and lower as your body mounts a response, it kind of goes through its life cycle, the virus itself. And this black line is your body's immune response. And appropriately it's starting to go up and it's catching up to the virus and um, able to start bringing the virus viral load down. And um, most people thankfully will continue to go from left to right without any issues. Eventually most and all of the virus gets um, handled by the immune system. The immune system ramps up and it is able to overcome the virus. But what happens in this slide here is what we call the cytokine response for reasons that we're starting to put together and understand better but not fully figured out yet, but there are some people that where the immune response, the body um, ultimately becomes its own worst enemy. And who knows this better than we as the lupus community, but here in some people, um, the body's response as it goes up, it goes up way too much and it creates a very severe inflammatory um, process with the release of what we call cytokines, these signals for the immune system, and it just drives it into way overdrive. And that inflammatory process is what floods the lungs with fluid, makes it difficult to breathe, and, um, and in other parts of the body can lead to clots and uh, you know, the very severe complications that you've been hearing and reading about. And we know for sure, whether you have lupus or not, that there are certain characteristics of people that um, put them at much higher risk for going into this severe inflammatory syndrome. And that is the older that you are. DM stands for diabetes mellitus or diabetes. Um, this is atherosclerotic heart disease or heart disease, um, having plaques or plugging of the arteries of the heart. 
renal is kidney or sorry, any kidney disease. Um, this is hypertension or high blood pressure. Uh, men greater than women have a um, high risk of this. And then there's some other factors, but these are the main ones up here. So even in the general population, you know, uh, to some degree, everyone has to make this sort of risk benefit analysis. And, you know, the more you have these, these, these sort of add up together, and this slide sort of demonstrates that. This is looking at how age and um, obesity, older age and obesity can combine together, just looking at those two and, and really drive up the risk of having that severe inflammatory syndrome. So this dark color, um, if you're in this area, that means you're at a much higher risk of having that severe inflammatory syndrome. Um, and then conversely, if you're in the bottom left, uh, you have a low risk. So when you go left to right, you're going from young to older. So no matter where you are, in this box, if you go from left to right, the older you are, the darker this color becomes. And so the higher risk of going into inflammatory syndrome. If you go from bottom to top, you're going from um, uh, thinner to uh, more obese. And so again, no matter where you are in this square, the higher you go vertically, the darker the color becomes. And then when you combine the two, if you're older and obese, then you have really severe risk um, these things here in the box are these cytokines, these signals that we're seeing a lot of um, in that box. Uh, this comes from a, an immunology paper. So, uh, you know, when you, when you combine risks, it even becomes greater. So if you have uh, older age and diabetes, that's going to really drive you into that corner. Um, but then let's say you have three of these things, age, diabetes, and heart disease, and then uh, even four. So the more you have of, of this, you're being put more and more into sort of the, the section of the box with the highest risk. So you get the picture. Um, and, and so that's what, uh, that's part of, I think, what you need to think about as you weigh uh, any situation. Uh, uh, let me just talk quickly about the vaccine. I'll circle back to kind of thinking in, you know, in whole about how to go through this day to day. You know, are, are vaccines effective in lupus? So we, we've talked about just masking in general um, before. We've also touched about, you know, vaccines. And, uh, you know, what I can say is this. Um, the vast majority of physicians and scientists that work in the um, autoimmune field, the lupus field, they advocate for vaccines given the, the risks of COVID. It's, it's coming out in some studies that even though people with lupus may not be at high risk for getting COVID as we originally feared, and I think it has a lot to do with the great job that you guys have done throughout the pandemic in taking care of yourselves and protecting the best that you are able to. But um, the, some reports out in New York and other parts of the, of, the, of the world that we're also trying to get data in Atlanta is that there's a suggestion that there may be more deaths, relatively speaking. So, um, and also having lupus puts you at risk for all those other risk factors for having severe inflammatory syndrome from, from COVID, like the diabetes, especially from prednisone, high blood pressure, um, kidney involvement, because I know some of you have that as part of the lupus. So, uh, you know, it, if given that scenario, the COVID, the risk of poor outcomes from COVID itself really outweighs um, any potential risk of any ba anything bad happening from the vaccine. And you know, a simple way of putting it is, you know, the worst thing that could potentially happen is maybe that the vaccines are not as effective. And so even though you're hearing about 90, 90% plus of efficacy or effectiveness for the vaccines in most people, 
even if it were 60 or 50 percent as you know effective in people with lupus you know that's still more effectiveness that you would have against the virus than you did before the vaccine and given that people with lupus have all of these potential other risk factors you know the vaccines are are, are worth it in most people's mind including myself um, now having said that we again to kind of help you understand for yourself what risks and benefits you want to take. Um, you know, the safety generally doesn't seem to be different of in people with lupus in terms of the vaccine compared to those in the general population. Uh, you know, in the general population, there have been some reports of uh, very rare reports of autoimmune syndromes, but they, they mostly have been transient. So um, it's not clear at all that these are even directly as a result of the vaccine. And most of the time, if they are, they're, they're temporary. And the ones, the very, very few that have been longer and caused more problems, these autoimmune syndromes, it's not very clear at all that, it's, that they're related to the vaccine. Now, in lupus, we, we're still needing more time to get better data on this and know that at Emory and Grady and throughout the world, there are a lot of people that are just so wanting to give you better information. We're working really hard. Uh, so no clear um, data is out there. But there, there have been reports of flares after vaccines. Now, what I should have said is that the majority, the vast majority of the people that I'm hearing of um, at Emory and Grady who have gotten the vaccine with lupus have done fine. And I'm also hearing that the vast majority of people with lupus have gotten the vaccine from all of my colleagues throughout the world are doing fine. But there are some reports, just like in the general population, of you know, lupus flares that have occurred in people with lupus. And it's not clear whether it's due to lupus itself, it was just something um, unrelated to the vaccine, or was it related to the vaccine or something else? And and that is the million dollar question for many of us, um, but we, we just haven't figured that out. Um, but I think the general feeling is that overall, when you take a look at these rare, relatively rare events below, that the safety appears to be no different than the general population. And so therefore that's why um, the vast majority consider the, the vaccines and recommend them for people with, uh, with lupus. Now, one other thing to kind of put into your, your head as you consider all of this is that there are some therapies that interfere with the vaccine response. And I mentioned this in the past, rituxan or rituximab is the, is the biggest, um, um, has the biggest impact on vaccine response in the sense that it reduces the, the vaccine effectiveness in people who um, get and receive rituximab, which is still used in people with lupus. Um, abatacept, especially in the intravenous form, is a biologic medication that's used mostly in rheumatoid arthritis, but it's not unheard of in some people and with an overlap or, or lupus-like features. So that's probably the second most um, impactful medication in terms of reducing the effectiveness of the COVID vaccine. Um, there's a, a group of medications, again, mostly used in rheumatoid arthritis called JAK inhibitors that is a step down from rituximab, abatessup, and then uh, these JAK inhibitors. And then uh, again, in sort of this lower part, um, uh, steroids, especially at the higher doses. So the prednisone, if you're on 5, 10 milligrams, we don't think it makes a significant difference, but if you're on higher doses, especially for longer periods of time, uh, as well as methotrexate, that may have some interference with the vaccine. Now, now again, um, it doesn't mean that it's going to be more dangerous, so it doesn't seem to be associated with safety. It just means effectiveness. And also, again, remember that in my mind, 40% um, effectiveness of a vaccine going coming down from 90 percent is a huge drop but still 40 percent if that means uh, milder uh, infection if god forbid you were to get it 
then that would be worth it. So when you think about, um, about what to do um, in the general public, uh, first think about your vaccine status. And if you are um, vaccinated, I, you should feel more comf confident. And um, you could probably be closer to the general guidelines that I mentioned in the CDC, basically that you can go back to normal activities, essentially, um, even being exposed potentially to those with COVID around you. I mean, that's what the data shows. Um, but, but that's really, and I think people that are more uh, with lupus on the milder spectrum. So again, not having some of these issues down here. So the opposite of these issues down here would be someone who's younger, um, uh, female who doesn't have these lung and kidney issues or these other medical issues, and especially are not on any of um, these medications, especially the ones on the right, on the left, um, but maybe just a couple of milligrams of prednisone and Plaquenil, uh, relatively younger female who's healthy otherwise and had relatively mild lupus. You know, that person, I would, I would, fairly com confidently say that you know you, 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 should, you can probably act as though you were uh, in the general population in terms of the CDC guidance. But then the more you have of these uh, issues, I think that the greater the risks that you might have if you were to get infected. And um, especially with the medications at the bottom, the greater the chance that the vaccine will be less effective. So again, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't be without a mask, but I think it depends on your risk tolerance. What issues do you have um, in your personality and what your doctors is sort of suggesting to you? Maybe out of all of this, you only have one thing wrong and that's the lung issue, but that lung issue was really, really severe. And it's left you with very damaged, scarred uh, lungs. It's not getting any worse. Things are really calm immunologically, but you have such severe scarring that if you were to have an inflammatory process triggered by a COVID infection, you would have much less reserve in your lungs to overcome that and, um, and, and recover quickly. And, and completely. So it depends on the degree of severity, not just the number. And so all of these things are just sort of coming into my mind as I talk to individuals in clinic every week. And, and, and you know, a lot of times I get very similar questions that you know, they just want to hear, do what, can I do this or can't I do that? And it, it, what, you know, I think my role is really just to to kind of remind people where I think you are in that spectrum of um, severity. Where are you in this box? Are you really on the low side? Are you clearly on the high side? And I think those are the easier questions to answer, obviously. But um, the reality is that people are often sort of somewhere in this big middle part, maybe sometimes leaning a little closer to here, some back to here. But that's not even the only thing that matters. It's, it's that on top of, again, your individual factors, your risk tolerance, what you want to do um, and need to do, um, and, and your, your job that you have to maintain to, to survive. So you know, these are all important factors. Um, sorry. Um, so I, I'll look at the, the chat box to see if anybody has any additional questions. I see one or a couple, and I'll get to that since we have a little time. So please enter some if, if you want. But I'll end here by just this slide is to remind me that um, you know, it, it, it's an interesting time that we're going through again, this new phase of the pandemic. And uh, 
you know, despite kind of the feelings that we all may have, just to remember the other person on the other side. And, and we're hearing so much in the in media about getting vaccinated, getting vaccinated, getting vaccinated. And I'm taught even as a, a medical provider to push that we have to you know, fight against anti-vaxxers, the vaccine hesitancy. And I think on paper that makes sense, but I've also been reminded that there are a lot of reasons why um, people wear the mask or, do, or don't wear the masks. And there are a lot of reasons why people get um, vaccinated and there are a lot of reasons why people don't get vaccinated. And you just don't know, we're, we're really quick to judge. And so this is just a plea for us as a community to continue to, um, to listen first and, and then to um, provide suggestions in, in an edifying, loving manner. So, um, you know, whenever I see somebody or hear some, someone that with lupus, that maybe in my mind would be such a good, great candidate for a vaccine. Um, you know, I've been taught by you and many of you and others, just there's a lot of stories behind that. Um, I mean, on a simple level, it could be that you're just not medically eligible for one. I know some people that have had very severe allergic reactions and uh, that's one clear reason that the CDC even agrees that you shouldn't get a COVID vaccine if you had a severe reaction. You know, we, for those of you who've gotten a vaccine, that's one of the first questions you get asked. Have you had a severe reaction to a previous vaccine? Um, but, you know, those people don't have a card or a sign on their masks saying so. And there can be a lot of stigma if, if um, you're walking around not having the vaccine, um, wearing the masks, um, so, you know, just know whether you're wearing it, whether you're not, um, you know, we're, we're here to kind of walk together, support each other, provide information, and over time, you'll make the best decision for yourself, uh, and, and I'll aim to walk with you along the way. Okay, um, I'm going to go to the chat here. I'm still wearing my mask regardless. Uh, you're not around people um, doing the same thing since 2006, staying away from crowds and sick people. Um, you know that, and you know that's the most conservative thing to do, and that is in your nature and acceptable to you, and. And that's providing you even more protection above and beyond um, everything that we're doing as a general public. So I, I mean that I accept that completely. And it's interesting, you know, in in Asian countries, they've worn masks before uh, even this pandemic. Some of it related to pollution and some cultural aspects that I don't I don't even fully completely understand. But I remember reading an article about how. In other cultures, you know, it's just so it was so much more acceptable. It, it, it was it was not unusual to see someone in, in public or in a subway wearing a mask before the pandemic for a variety of reasons. And so for us, it's much of it's a bigger shock in general uh, when we had to go through this in, in the pandemic. But you know, I think post pandemic or post the initial phase. Um, you know, there's going to be more room for a lot of people to just continue to live that particular lifestyle, if you will, is to be uh, even more protective and cautious. Uh, after being fully vaccinated, is there a test to determine a person's immune status? Yeah, the, the, I'm hearing that question a lot. Can you get Test it to see if your vaccine is, is working. And the short answer is no. Um, the, there, there is a test to see if you've um, been, so before the vaccines, you might remember a, a COVID antibody test. It doesn't tell you if you're currently infected, 
but it tells you that you've been exposed to the virus or infected in the past. So it tests your antibodies um, to the COVID virus in your blood that stays in your blood for many months afterwards. And um, what the vaccines do is it triggers your body to produce antibodies against the virus as a way of protecting you and um, mounting a much faster and effective response against the virus if you were to be exposed. So I can understand people thinking, well, you can, um, if, if you can test the antibodies after you, you were exposed to COVID and see if, you were, and see if you have them, why can't you see if the vaccine has triggered those antibodies to protect you? The problem is that tests that we have to detect the antibodies produced after you get infected by COVID is a, um, that test looks at a different part of the antibody than the antibodies produced by the vaccine. So um, when I say antibody in both of these respects, they're different. So the, the commercially available um, antibody tests that are out there only test for the antibodies that you produce, um, only, only, only detect, are able to detect in a way the antibodies that are produced after you get infected, but not the antibodies that are produced after you get vaccinated. So um, unfortunately, there's no way of, of testing that. Okay. All right, so um, seeing no additional questions, just thank you again for your time. Uh, I can really feel in the next, oh, it could be even sooner than this, but I would say four to six months to, to 12 months. So sometime you know, by fall, or winter, we're just gonna have a big uptick in a lot of information. I think there's gonna be more specific lupus guidance coming along. Um, all the numbers, by the way, I should have mentioned this, that we're seeing in terms of decline, has a big, has a lot to do with the vaccines that are being um, taken by the general public in particular. So the more people around us that get vaccinated, the less the vi uh, areas the virus has to go. So if anything, um, if you're on board with the vaccines, if you can encourage your family members and your friends, if you're comfortable with that, I think that helps all of us. The, the other thing though, is that we're not as close together all the time as we are in the winter time. So some think that maybe as we go into the summer when it gets really hot and people are indoors more because of the air conditioning. Um, and you know, the reality is in states like Georgia, the majority of people, if you take the entire state are not vaccinated, it's still less than 50%. So there, there's theoretically a possibility for a spike. And certainly in the winter time, there's always the big wild card of variants that come from other parts of the world. And so that's why important to keep track of what's going on elsewhere because that those are the factories for new variants to come out. And, and as you can see, borders mean nothing to the virus. And it's amazing how quickly it goes from one end of the globe to the other end, uh, no matter how many restrictions you have. So um, you know, keep that, we'll all just keep each other aware. And um, please tell me if you hear of anything new or, or something that I miss, and we'll continue to um, post more information. And Terry and her staff at the LFA uh, Georgia chapter you continue to do such an amazing job. Please check out their website and contact them. They have links to the national um, site for more information. And continue to use the email address here to send us any questions or any other comments and suggestions. And I'll, and I'll continue to meet with you on the second Sunday of every month to the best of my ability to keep you updated. So stay safe, everybody. And thank you for your time.